Exodus chapter 32. I would remind you that what we are about to read is nothing less than the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in the, their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And Yahweh said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And Yahweh said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff Necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. But Moses implored Yahweh his God and said, O oh, Yahweh, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And Yahweh relented from the disaster he had spoken of bringing on his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets that were written on both sides, on the front and on the back. They were written. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory, or the sound of cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. And as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people, that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. (laughs) And when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision of their enemies. 
Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on Yahweh's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered round him. And he said to them, Thus says Yahweh, God of Israel, put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of Yahweh, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. The next day, Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to Yahweh. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to Yahweh and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold, but now... If you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. But Yahweh said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then Yahweh sent a plague on the people because they made the calf the one that Aaron had made. Let's pray. Father, we come to a familiar chapter of Scripture, and yet it is quite weighty. And so we pray that by your Spirit we would have our minds and our hearts opened and that you would impress upon us the message that you desire us to hear, that having encountered your word this morning, we would be a changed people and a changed church. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I said to begin the service, a few weeks ago, Cammie and I were at SeaTac, and we were waiting there to get on to the first leg of our flight to Southeast Asia. We were flying initially from uh, SeaTac to Tokyo. And there we were waiting to get on our plane, and and in front of us was was a young man, He was wearing expensive Nikes. He had a fancy shirt on. He had those huge headphones listening to his music. And he was standing there in front of us, and he had toilet paper hanging off the back of his shorts. (laughs) Now, I will be honest with you this morning. If I were by myself, I wouldn't have said anything. I'm not sure if that makes me a bad person or not. But my precious wife elbowed me and said quietly in my ear, you should tell him. (laughs) Because she's wiser than I am, I complied. Question, has that ever happened to you? Piece of toilet paper stuck to your shoe, or even worse, to your pants, and someone eventually has mercy upon you? and tells you, and while on one hand you're relieved, what are you thinking? How long have I been walking around with this attached to my person? Right? Or how many of you have had like a piece of food stuck to your face? Or if you are blessed by the Lord enough to be able to grow a beard, a piece of food stuck to your beard, and you've walked around, who knows for how long, when somebody finally tells you about it? Or for you men, you've had your fly open, right? (laughs) And what everyone else can see it, except for who? (laughs) Except for you, right? The same is true when it comes to idolatry, isn't it? We are always better at recognizing the idols of others, but not our own, right? We are experts in idol identification for everyone else except for the person in the mirror, right? This is true societally. So when we were in Southeast Asia, it was easy for Cammy and I to identify 
the idolatry and the false gods and the false religions. This is also true personally, right? I can see that you are struggling with the idolatry of your job or if of your money or of your comfort. But me, I don't struggle with any of those things. And yet our passage this morning, perhaps the most famous passage in the Bible on idolatry, shows us that idolatry is not merely an Israelite problem. It's not a back then problem. Idolatry is a human problem. It is a here and now problem. And this brings us to our main point this morning. Here's our main point. The human heart is insistent on idolatry. Praise God for his provision of a mediator. As we walk through this familiar passage, I want us to see two things clearly from the text. First, that the human heart, that is, our hearts are insistent on idolatry. As John Calvin once wrote, man's nature is a perpetual factory of idols. Therefore, second, we should praise God that he has provided for idolaters like the Israelites of old and even more so for idolaters like you and me, a mediator. The human heart is insistent on idolatry. Praise God for his provision of a mediator. Let's begin with our first point this morning. If you're following along in your outline, idolatry unleashed. Idolatry unleashed. We find this in the first six verses of Exodus 32. We read in verse 1, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. So let's just pause there and ask ourselves, where are we in the story? Well, strangely enough, the last time I preached on the book of Exodus was on June 26th, and we saw that morning in Exodus 24, 18, that Moses had gone up to the mountain, and he remained there for 40 days and 40 nights. So that's the context of our passage. Moses has been gone not just for a day or two days, but for weeks. And the restless and impatient Israelites in verse 1 say to Aaron, as a reminder, that's Moses' older brother and the man that Moses left in charge while he was up on the mountain, they say to him, up, Make us gods who shall go before us. Now, let's just note here that the word gods there is in the plural, right? Which shows that the Israelites who had been instructed and told that there is but one God and you should worship him and him alone could not shake the pantheistic worldview that they had been steeped in for generations in Egypt. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't get rid of it. Right? Even, even the fact that Aaron builds a golden calf is probably an allusion to one of the primary Egyptian gods of the time, Apis, which is just a reminder of how influenced by our culture we are. And how does Aaron respond to their request? Verse Two, he says, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Verse 4, and he removed the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. Now, another question for us, okay? We are dealing with a formerly enslaved people. Where in the world did they get rings of gold? Answer, Exodus 12, 35 and 36. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. Verse 36, and Yahweh had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. The rings of gold that are melted down and fashioned into an idol were the very gifts Yahweh had given 
abandoned them as they plundered Egypt before leaving. The very gifts and blessings God had given them are literally being twisted and warped into an idol. Church, don't miss the irony of this. And don't miss the fact that we do the same thing. As, as Christians, our greatest temptation is not going to be to make for ourselves a little statue of Buddha or a little statue of the Hindu elephant god. Our greatest temptation as church-going, Bible-believing Christians is to take the good gifts and blessings that God has given us, our jobs, our wealth, our marriages, our children, our freedoms, our health, our talents, our hobbies, and warp those things into idols. Things that consume our affections, our emotions, our time, our energy, our sacrifices and identity. To take good things and make them ultimate things. And that's what Israel has done. And upon seeing this golden calf, the people respond to one another. Verse 4, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Verse 5, seeing their response, their positive response, Aaron gets excited. And so he decides to build an altar before the golden calf and declares, tomorrow shall be a feast to Yahweh. Verse 6, and they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. Now, notice what's happening here. Aaron has constructed an idol, and yet what are the people attributing to that idol? They are attributing to that idol the redemptive act of God in rescuing them from Egypt. Not only that, what does Aaron call the golden calf? He calls the golden calf Yahweh. And how do they worship Yahweh? In a legitimate way, by offering sacrifices upon an altar. So in Aaron's mind and in their minds, this golden calf was a legitimate representation of Yahweh who saved them. So what's happening here? Well, on one hand, what they had done was undeniably forbidden by God. Right? It was a blatant breaking of the first and second commandments and also the commands that come after the Ten Commandments, which explain the Ten Commandments. Here's an example, Exodus 20, verse 23. You shall not make for yourselves gods of gold. There it is. So this is blatant idolatry. And yet the people and Aaron are mixing with blatant idolatry elements of the true worship of Yahweh. You see that? I heard one leader of a missions training organization recently say this. The fastest growing religion in the world is not Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. The fastest growing religion in the world is syncretism. It is the merging of two or more religions or ideologies. And the worst part about it is that often, especially in the world of missions, one of those religions included in syncretism is what? It's Christianity. And here's the thing. This is not only rampant in the world of missions and in countries out there, but this is rampant in our country and in our own churches. See, you cannot have the pure gospel of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and mix with it a little bit of my good works and my moralism. It doesn't work like that. You cannot have the pure gospel and mix with it a little bit of prosperity teaching, a little bit of Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes and Paula White. You cannot have the pure gospel and mix with it a little bit of new age mysticism. You cannot hold to the pure gospel while giving yourself to worldly materialism. God will not be mocked. He will not share his glory with another. 
This is our first point. It is idolatry unleashed, which begs the question of us this morning. What idols have we erected in our own hearts? Is it a particular relationship? Perhaps it's a romantic relationship or a familial relationship. For you students, is it your grades or how you're perceived at school? Is it for the rest of us? Is it your reputation? Is it your wealth, your money, your possessions? Is it your plans for your future or the future of your children? Is it a title that you possess or desire to possess? Is it an area of ministry? Is it pleasure? The pleasure of sex, the pleasure of food and drink, the pleasure that your hobbies give you, the pleasure of being liked by people? Is it your own health? Is it your comfort, your safety, your security, or that of your family? What is it in life that you want, desire, or wish for more than anything? What is it in life that you will act to preserve at all costs, even the cost of your soul? What are you willing to sin for in order to get or to preserve? Or, or when you find yourself getting angry or being judgmental of others, ask yourself, what desire or goal of yours are they standing in the way of? What do you fear most? What do you worry about most? Become anxious about most. What do you spend your time, energy, money, and thought life on? Answer these questions and questions like these, and you will find your idols. The human heart is insistent on idolatry. That includes you. That includes me. Praise God for his provision of a mediator. Now, we'll meet the first mediator in the next two points. Point number two. Now, in these next two points, we have these two cycles that contain the same three elements. Okay? Cycle one, cycle two, both contain these three elements, judgment, intercession, and punishment. Judgment, intercession, and punishment. Let me show you a slide that summarizes this first cycle. So in verses 7 through 10, Yahweh announces his intention to judge Israel for their idolatry. He says to Moses, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. Then in verses 11 through 14, Moses intercedes for Israel. He implores Yahweh on, based on Yahweh's character and promises to relent from his wrath. Finally, in verses 15 through 29, it is Moses and not Yahweh directly, but Moses who goes down from the mountain, sees the rebellion of his people and punishes them in three different ways. So that's a summary of the first cycle. Now, we don't have time to examine every single verse this morning, sadly. I would love to do that. Pastor Westcott texted me yesterday. We were texting back and forth, and he said I could preach two sermons this morning since I've been gone for so long. But I think if I did that, our children's ministry volunteers would start a riot. So <laughs> not going to do that. What we're going to do, because of our main point this morning, is focus primarily on the mediator, Moses. Okay, so that's going to be our primary focus for these next few points. The first thing we see about this mediator, Moses, is that he cares more about God's glory and God's people than himself. Notice what God says to him in verse 10. He says, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. Read this. In order that I may make a great nation of you. If you are aware of what goes on in the book of Genesis, that phrase right there should ring in your ears. 
because that's a direct allusion to God's promise to make a great nation out of Abraham. Now here God says he's going to start over with Moses. Now, if I was Moses, you know what I'd be thinking? Wait, so you're telling me that you're going to destroy these grumbling, complaining, doubting, unfaithful, ungrateful, idolatrous, rebellious people and start over with me? (laughs) And make a great nation out of me? Thank God I'm not Moses. Because Moses cares more about God's glory and God's people than himself. Right? Instead of letting God go through with his proposed plan, Moses steps into the proverbial gap and he begins to intercede for the people, for these idolatrous, rebellious people. Why? Because he knows God's glory is at stake. Look at how he prays in verses 11 through 13. Verse 11 says, essentially, God, you rescued Israel, your covenant people from Egypt by your mighty hand. For you to destroy Israel now would undermine your great work. He says in verse 12, God, you already showed your complete dominance over Pharaoh and Egypt. And as we saw, the gods of Egypt... For you to destroy Israel now would give the surviving Egyptians and the surrounding nations reason to mock not just your people, but you. Your glory is at stake. Verse 13, God, you promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You swore by your own name to multiply them and deliver them into the promised land. For you to destroy Israel now would make you a liar and a breaker of your promises. Moses, the mediator, comes and he cares more about God's glory and God's people than himself. Now, as a side note, I do want to say a few words before we move into the next subpoint on the notion of God relenting. We see that in verse 14. We read, Yahweh relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Same word is used back in verse 12. We need to ask the question, what does it mean for God to relent? Other translations read for him to change his mind. The old King James Version actually reads to repent. What does it mean for God to repent or for the unchanging God to change his mind? It's a big question. Okay, so we need to affirm a few things here. First, we need to affirm that as we unfold the pages of Scripture, that God is completely sovereign. He is sovereign. As Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Or as Paul says in Ephesians 1, 11, that God is the one who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So we need to affirm that God is completely sovereign. Second, we need to affirm that God truly intended on annihilating the people of Israel. In in recounting this event, Moses says in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 19, I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure that Yahweh bore against you so that he was ready to destroy you. Had Moses not interceded for the people, God would have destroyed them. That's what it says. So we need to affirm God truly intended on annihilating the people of Israel. God is sovereign. God truly intended to destroy the people. Third, we need to affirm that Moses' intercession on Israel's behalf truly moved God to relent from his intention to destroy the people. Friends, this is the wonder of prayer. That the prayers of a finite, sinful man would stay the hand of of the omnipotent God of the universe. That is mind-boggling. But look at how the verse ends. 
Deuteronomy 9.19, but Yahweh listened to me that time also. Or look at how Psalm 106 verse 23 puts it. Therefore, he said he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen one, stood in the breach before him to turn away his wrath from destroying them. So we need to affirm that Moses' intercession on Israel's half moves the hand of the omnipotent God. How do we put all of that together? Here's how we'll try to put it all together. That God in his complete sovereignty, intended on Moses interceding on behalf of idolatrous Israel at this point in time in such a way that God would respond by turning away from his wrath. That God's placement of a mediator right here, right now, was part of his plan to stay his hand from actually destroying his people. This is the same thing we see with Jonah and the Ninevites, right? When God promises the destruction of Nineveh for its gross sin, he means it. Right? He's not joking around. He's not lying. He's not telling the half truth. He means to destroy Nineveh. And yet he also means to send to Nineveh a prophet to preach to them, a mediator. And he intends for the people of Nineveh to hear the words of the prophet that he sent and to repent from their sin. And we read this in Jonah 3, verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Which means that a mediator, even an unwilling one, whose preaching produces repentance and stays the wrath of God is part of God's plan to turn from his anger and show mercy to these Gentile people. In the same way, Moses' intercession on behalf of Israel is part of God's sovereign plan to turn his actual anger away from them so that he might show mercy to them. I love how David Platt puts it. God, in his providence, we could sub the word in his sovereignty, God, in his providence, has chosen to make prayer a powerful means by which we interact with him and effectively shape the course of history. This is not an overstatement. That statement booms across the pages of the Bible. People pray and fire falls from heaven. The lame walk, the hungry are fed, and the dead come to life. God in his providence has not called us in prayer to watch history, but rather to shape history for the glory of his great name. If you have ever wondered, why should I pray if God is sovereign? That's why. Because God in his sovereignty intends to respond to your faith-filled prayers. Your intercessory prayers can move the omnipotent hand of God. And all of that is part of his good, perfect, and sovereign plan. That's point, sub point one. Sub point two, back to Moses, the mediator. Second thing we see about Moses, the mediator, is that he is zealous for the holiness of God and God's people. He is zealous for the holiness of God and God's people. Moses comes down from the mountain and he finds his people, God's people, engaged in ugly idolatry and he is filled with zeal for the holiness of God and God's people. This comes out in three ways. First, it comes out as he breaks the two tablets. We read in verse 19, as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing. Now, just side note, I don't think Moses is a Baptist and he dislikes dancing. So I don't think it's how we're to read that verse, okay? Side note. 
Moses' anger burned hot. Now notice that Moses' emotions parallel Yahweh's emotions back in verse 12. Okay? So he's not doing this out of unrighteous anger. His anger is mimicking the anger of his God. So Moses' anger burned hot, and he threw the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. And that is an act that is symbolic. Why? Because by breaking the two tablets which contain the words of the covenant, he is showing that the terms of God's covenant with Israel have been broken. They have broken the covenant. This is symbolically imaged in the breaking of those tablets. Second, Moses' zeal for God's holiness and the holiness of God's people comes as he destroys and defiles the idol that had been made. Verse 20, he took the calf that they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. Here's the point. Okay, the idol, which had been made of gold, probably gold overlaid on top of wood, essentially, all of those materials becomes what? Right? If the people of Israel eventually consumed it by drinking it, what would those materials have become, without being too graphic? Human waste. Right? That's intentional. Moses is intentionally not just destroying the idol, he is defiling the very materials used to make the idol so that they would never be fit to be used again. So zealous is he for God's holiness and the holiness of God's people. Third, Moses' zeal for God's holiness and the holiness of God's people culminates in him commissioning the Levites to slaughter those engaged in idolatry. Verse 26, Moses draws a line in the sand, and he says, who is on Yahweh's side? The Levites step forward, and he instructs them in verse 27, go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. Now, I don't think we're to understand this as being just indiscriminate killing. I think a better way to understand this is that the Levites are going through the camp to kill those who are still engaged in idolatrous behavior. So if you run back through the chapter again, you'll notice that there are these references to the people doing things like playing and shouting and singing and dancing and breaking loose. Some commentators have associated those things with sexual immorality. Not sure. But the point is that some of those things, this celebration, this loud, boisterous celebration, some of these things are coming after Moses had broken the tablets and destroyed the idol. And especially the destruction of the idol would have taken some time, right? And yet there are still people, having seen these things, celebrating and rejoicing over this golden calf. And I believe that it is those people who are still engaged in that type of behavior that the Levites are supposed to kill. And they end up killing 3,000 men. And the point of that is that he is purifying the people of those who were unrepentant of their idolatry. He is purifying the camp of the sinners. All of these things point to Moses' zealous desire to preserve God's holiness and the holiness of God's people. He is showing the people the seriousness of sin, the heinousness of idolatry, and he is purifying them. Now notice that he is held up in contrast to whom in this text? To Aaron. Do you remember how Pastor Westcott started off his sermon last week about the priests of Israel, and specifically the high priests? Who's the high priest at that time? Aaron. Not starting off so hot, is he? Aaron was supposed to be the chief mediator between God and the rest of the nation. And yet, unlike Moses, we find Aaron in this passage caring more about himself than about God and God's people. 
Look at verse 22. Aaron says, Moses, you know the people that they are set on evil? What is he doing there? Blame shifting. Does that remind you of anyone we've seen in Genesis? Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve. And instead of owning up to his failures as a leader and confessing his sin, he says, this is where you guys all laughed, that upon receiving the gold from the people, he just threw it into the fire and out came what? The calf. He is failing to own up for his failures as a leader. And yet, the, the point of the story is not Aaron. The point of the story is Moses as the mediator. See, where Aaron stumbles as a leader and as the chief priest who should have been the chief mediator, Moses rises up as the mediator that the people of God so desperately need. And this brings us to our second cycle of judgment, intercession, and punishment. Cycle two. Again, let's look at the summary slide. In verses 30 through 34, Moses returns to the presence of God to once again make intercession for the people. Then in verse 35, punishment comes again. But this time, it is not Moses, but God who punishes the people by sending a plague in their midst. Now, we don't know the extent of this plague. Not sure. But it's definitely not what God intended to do earlier, which was to completely consume the people and start over with Moses. So we see intercession, punishment, and then in the first part of chapter 33, we see another threat of judgment announced. But this time... Instead of complete destruction, look at what God says. Actually, do I have it up there? Yeah, I do. God says to the people and Moses, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. Go into the promised land. But I will not go up among you. What is God's judgment here? Threat of judgment? That the people will inherit the promised land but will lose the covenant presence of God. And we'll see next week that when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. For there is nothing worse than losing the covenant presence of God. That's what hell is. It's to be removed eternally from the good, gracious, glorious presence of God forever and ever and ever. Now, again, for the sake of time, I'm going to continue our focus on Moses. When Moses goes up to intercede for the people for a second time as a mediator, he says in verse 30, you have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to Yahweh. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. And then he prays this in verse 32. But now... If you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. And this brings us to our third characteristic of Moses, the mediator. He is willing to give up his life as a substitute for his people. He is willing to give up his life as a substitute for his people. When Moses uses that word atonement, it's a word that's not used until Exodus 29 and 30, and it's a fully loaded word, right? It's used throughout the Torah to describe especially the offerings that the priests made in order to cover over the sins of the people and thereby pacify the wrath of God. And here Moses says that he is going to attempt to make atonement for their sin. How, Moses, how are you going to do that? Verse 32, by offering himself to be blotted out of the book of God. Friends, this is not merely Moses offering to be killed on behalf of the people of Israel. Moses is offering to give up his eternal inheritance, his place in God's book of life in order that these people, these sinful, rebellious, idolatrous people might be saved. And how does God reply in verse 33? 
Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Here, here is Moses, the mediator, saying, God, I'll take their place. And God replying, no, Moses, you cannot atone for them. You cannot take their place. You cannot be their substitute. And that just rings in our ears, doesn't it? Until we get to a greater mediator. See, Jesus comes as a mediator to stand between a holy God and idolaters like you and me. Like Moses, Jesus comes as a mediator who cares desperately about God's glory and about God's people. Like Moses, Jesus comes as a mediator who is zealous for God's holiness and for the holiness of God's people. And, and like Moses, Jesus comes as a mediator who offers up himself as a substitute for sinful people in order that their sins might be atoned for, might be covered, that the righteous wrath of God might be satisfied. But unlike Moses, his offering is received by God. Why? Because he is the sinless mediator. See, Moses could not atone, could not be Israel's substitute because he himself was a sinner. But not Jesus. Jesus was sinless, and therefore he could legitimately die as a substitute for idolaters like you and me. And furthermore, because Jesus was fully God and fully man, his death was not a one-to-one -one transaction, right? Rather, his death was effective to cover the sins of the world, of men and women and children from every tribe, people, language, and nation, because Jesus is the perfect mediator. And guess what? The book of Revelation, it speaks of a book, a similar book as is mentioned in our passage. But this book in Revelation is called the Lamb's Book of Life. And in it are written names, not of those who have never sinned against God, not of those who have never committed idolatry, not of those who have never rebelled against Yahweh, but of those who have been predestined and justified and called and adopted and sanctified and kept and glorified by the blood of the Lamb. See, church, we have a greater mediator than Moses. As Paul puts it in 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Amen? Or as the author of Hebrews puts it in Hebrews 9, 15, therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal life. Or as the hymn so beautifully says, before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest, a great mediator, whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads, intercedes for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me thence depart. The human heart is insistent on idolatry. Praise God for his provision of a perfect mediator. Your heart is insistent on idolatry. You are an idolater. You have turned away from the God of the universe to idols, just like Israel. Oh, friend, turn to Christ. Turn to the perfect mediator. Turn to the one whose shed blood is sufficient. Cast yourself upon the perfect mediator and find in him today peace with God and the promise of eternal life. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, God, we thank you that you have provided for sinful, idolatrous, rebellious people like us, a perfect 
mediator. One who intercedes for us. One who laid down his life for us. One who atoned for our sins. One whose blood covers over our sins and pacifies your wrath. Oh God, we thank you for Jesus, that he is a greater mediator than Moses. May we cast ourselves upon him this day. May we worship him with incredible fervency. And empowered by his spirit, may we put to death all the idols that remain in our hearts. And we pray this in his name. Amen.